Lord. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6. I'll read verses. I'll begin in verse 10 reading. Our focus this morning is going to be verse 11. Thank you, Jesus. We do. We have so, so much to be thankful for. Our God has been so, so good to us. And I just want to say to, to our pastors that thank you guys. I, I tell you, I mean, I, I know you guys don't get to see a lot of what they do, but but these guys, they're tireless. They're committed to what they do. And I, I just uh, I want you guys to know that I appreciate you very, very much. And I don't know if y'all did. I, I I looked in my envelope. I got a 2019 F350 Larry Crew Cab. I, I don't know what you guys got. But <laughs> Not. <laughs> There'll be an altar call. I can ask forgiveness for lying. <laughs> hey, were you? Hmm? <laughs> Have y'all met my other Holy Spirit? Will you stand for the reading of God's Word, beginning in verse 10 of Ephesians 6? The title of the message today is The Schemes of the Devil. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore... Take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day, having done everything, stand firm. Father, we come in the name of Jesus. We love you and we praise you and we, we give you the glory that's due your name. Father God, all oh, the privilege of worship, the privilege of praise, the privilege of knowing that we are your children. We are the bride of Christ. We are indwelt and infilled with your own Holy Spirit. Father God, give us ears to hear what the Spirit might say to each of us this day and give us strength and courage to live our life for your glory and the exaltation of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray and all of God's people said, Amen. Now, last week, we just really looked at that first word in verse 10. Finally, and it's like a, it's like a last therefore, so you go back and you see what it's there for. And if you go back to Ephesians 5 and, and 18, we, we see that the command of the Lord is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. A right interpretation of that would be continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. So we should continuously be Spirit-filled Christians, if we're going to win in this world, if we're going to have victory in this world, and as we followed through that scripture, we saw over all the way to verse 10, we saw that application. It's, it, we've got to be spirit-filled in our worship. That's our church life, our, the way we live our lives. And, and in here, we, we need to be spirit-filled. We need to be spirit-filled in our marriage, guys. We need to be spirit-filled husbands and spirit-filled uh, wives, we need to be spirit-filled in our families, spirit-filled fathers and spirit-filled mothers. And then he talks about our work life, and it really represents the whole of the Christian life. And if we're going to win, if we're going to have victory in, in, in this battle, and you need to know that we have victory in Jesus. Now, we need to know that, that, that the Lord himself has given us everything we need to live in victory day by day by day. The victory is ours. And so I think a lot of times we, we don't feel like we're in victory or maybe we are being defeated. And sometimes the problem is we're just not spirit-filled. We're not, according to verse 10, being strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. We're not, we're not putting on the armor of God. I think a lot of us, when, and we're gonna, it's going to be a few weeks before we get to the armor itself. But, but I think a lot of us, you know, God, God has given us this holy armor to put on, to battle against Satan 
and the armor's laying there. I mean, everything you need, there's, there's the belt of truth, there's the breastplate of righteousness, there's the helmet of salvation, there's the, there's the, there, there's the, the, the sandals, the shod feet of the gospel of peace, there's, there's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But for most of us, it's still laying there. You hadn't put it on. And it's just like this coat, you know, if you're, if you're cold outside, you put on the coat, and you won't be cold anymore. And it's a, if you're going to have victory in this life that you have in Christ, then you have got to put on the spiritual armor. And you've got to know how to use it. And so that's, that's what we're getting at. But before, before we put it on and before we understand what each, each part of that armor is for, what purpose it, it is for, then we've got to understand who it is that we are fighting We've got to fully understand. He says, now Paul says in verse 11, put on the full armor of God. Now you've got to imagine this picture. Paul is sitting in, a, he, he, is, he is imprisoned. And he's sitting there chained to a Roman soldier. And so you can imagine Paul, Paul is sitting there, he's writing this letter to the church at Ephesus. He's chained to this Roman soldier. And so he has plenty of time to study the armor that this soldier is wearing and then make the spiritual application for those of us who are in Christ. The Christian armor that Paul talks about is to protect the Christian soul. It's to give us victory in the battle. You ought to hear that this morning. Everybody here, you, you need to get that. I don't, I don't know where you're at in life. I don't know what's going on in your life. Listen, you may, you may be walking in victory today. You may have complete victory in every area of your life. And if you are, you ought to stand up and shout, Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. But there's some of us sitting here today that are probably feeling defeated. You've tried and you've tried and you've tried and you've tried to no avail. And you ought to, but, but, but still, you ought to thank God that you are in Christ. He has made a way. And everything you need to go from victory unto victory unto victory in this world, in this physical world, God has already provided. You just need to appropriate it. You need to take hold of it. We have to understand that we are in a spiritual battle. It is the war of the ages, and we simply cannot and we must not be caught in this spiritual war against the devil and his minions without knowing how to fight the devil is out to steal your joy kill your peace and, and, and if he could destroy your soul or destroy your children or destroy your marriage or destroy your community, or destroy your church. We have to understand this morning that there's a real devil, and he absolutely hates you. He hates you. We're going to talk about that here in just a few minutes. The devil is out to steal, kill, and destroy everything that you and I as believers in the Lord Jesus hold dear. John Phillips said this, God has provided all that we need for complete protection of mind, heart, soul, spirit, conscience, and will. But we must put that armor on piece by piece. It is to our own peril if we choose not to. The Spirit-filled life a life controlled by the Holy Spirit and obedient to the commands of Christ, protected by the spiritual armor of God, will result in total and complete victory in every area of the believer's life. So we've got to pull up, put on the full armor of God. But before we start putting it on, we've got to understand really who we are fighting. He says, put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm. Now, those two words, those are important. 
three times. At the end of verse 13, at the beginning of verse 14, and here in verse 11, he says, stand firm. You know, that, that, those two words, they, they, mean to, they mean to hold stubbornly, to not let go, to, to, to hunker down. It's to insist upon something or to be emphatic about something. It's, it, it's, a, it's a resolute spirit. It is a refusal. Stand firm. Three times he says it. Stand firm. It is an absolute refusal to abandon what I believe. And we, the devil does attack. He does come against us. We're going to talk about those schemes here in just a minute. But he comes against us and he seeks to tear us down. He seeks to destroy our marriage and destroy our family and destroy our lives and destroy our church. But if we stand firm in the Lord, in the strength of his might, then we'll be victorious. He says, again in, in verse 10, he says, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. When you, when you look at what's he talking about when he says, in the strength of his might, be strong. Be strong. Be strong, be immovable, stand firm in the same power that resurrected Christ from the dead. See, that's the power that you and I stand in. Most of us as Christians today, we're trying to stand in our own power. We're trying to stand in our own flesh. We're trying to stand in our finite understanding. We're trying to stand in what we think. Stop it. Stop it. Stop standing in what you think. Stop standing in your flesh. Stand firm. Refusing to abandon your beliefs by the power that raised him from the dead. Amen, preacher. Thank you. Hmm. Stand firm. And then we stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about the devil, Satan, and, and, and about his schemes. I struggle with something. I believe that the Bible is the inerrant, infallible, authoritative, absolute truth of Almighty God. And if this Word of God, this sword of the Spirit, that I hold in my hand says there's a devil, then I don't need to question it. There is a devil. Yet over 60% of the church, of those who claim to be believers in the Lord Jesus, listen, you understand, if you don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died for your sins, was buried, rose from the grave, rose from the grave three days later, ascended into heaven, sitting at the right hand of God. You're not saved. Don't kid yourself about it. You're not. You're not. In fact, Jesus went on and said in John chapter 14, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you really believe him, you really love him, you're going to keep his commandments. You're going to follow him. It, it could be, I'm just saying, it could be that the reason... You're living a defeated life is you don't, you don't know Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. And I can get people to argue with this with me, and I don't want to get off point. But I, 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 don't want, I don't want to start an argument with people, with other preachers, or with, or with anything else. But the Bible is clear. God intends for His people to live in victory. 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 In fact, I'm going to take longer than I thought. Ephesians 3 and, and uh, verse 8. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. Thank you, Lord. 
and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages have been hidden in God who created all things. Listen. So the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known, what? Through the church. Look at your neighbors and say, that's me and you. To the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. You see? God. God, from the foundations of the earth, chose you to be his church so that through you his wisdom his eternal wisdom and his glory might be manifest through you to those demonic beings in the heavenly places god is using you yes we go through tough places Yes, we go through hard times, but God's Word is clear, and He intends for you to have victory. And if you'll just appropriate the tools He's given you, you can have that victory. The Scriptures give numerous names to the devil. He's, he's Abaddon, the destroying angel in Revelation 9-11. He's the accuser of the brethren in Revelation 12-10. 12, 12, he's the adversary in 1 Peter 5-8. He disguises himself as an angel of light in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. 14. He's the Antichrist in 1 John 4, 3. He's Beelzebub, the dung god, the ruler of the devils in Luke eleven fifteen. He's Belial, worthless in 2 Corinthians 6, 15. He's the crooked serpent in Isaiah 27, 1. He is the devil in Matthew 4, 1, 8, 5, 8, 11. And in chapter 9 and verse 32, he is, he is the dragon in Revelation 12, 7. He is the enemy. He, is, he, he hates and he is hostile toward the church. Matthew 13, 39. He's the father of lies. John 8, 44. He's the God of this world. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. He is a liar and he's the father of lies. John 8, 44. He's the man of sin or the man of lawlessness or the man of offense in 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. He's a murderer in John 8, 44. He's the serpent of old in Revelation 12. He's the power of darkness, the power of obscurity in Colossians 1.13. He's the prince of the devils in Matthew 12.24. He's the prince of the power of the air, the ruler who has authority over the air in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. The, the, he's been given many names in Scripture, and almost every one of them, listen to this, he's been given many names in Scripture, and almost every one of them has to do with his battle against the church his war against the church folks you, you have to get this this morning he the devil literally hates you he hates the human race but he hates you especially John 10 10 the thief comes only to steal kill and destroy. I came, Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. That's you and me. We are to be living the abundant life. Spiritual abundance, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, love, grace. First Peter 5, 8, be of sober spirit, be on the alert, your adversary, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Over 60% of professed believers in America are just devils. Don't believe in the literal devil. And my friend, if that's you, you have bought into a lie that's going to destroy you and it's going to destroy everything you believe in and hold dear. It's exactly because many believers either do not believe in the devil or they don't know how to fight him or who it is that they're fighting in this war. That our churches and marriages and families, communities and nations 
He is attacking today on every front. I saw a title of a book the other day. It said, The New Age of Outrage. Talking about our nation, our society today. Isn't it true? The New Age. I mean, it's like everywhere you turn, somebody's mad. Isn't it? I, we can talk to the Democrats. Well, they're mad. They're angry at everybody. Republicans, they're mad. They're angry at everybody. It, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't matter where you go. You've got these, if I can say it, idiots that keep trying to cause racial division in this country. You've got, there's division, there's outrage, there's bitterness, there's anger everywhere you look. You find it today in marriages. Marriages are, in America today are being ravaged. Ravaged. Christian marriages. Falling apart. Right and left. Families coming apart. Right and left. Parents mad at children. Children angry, angry and bitter at their mom or their dad. And then you come into church. And you find it in church. And people are just mad. Why are you mad? Bless God, I don't know. I'm just mad. I mean, it, it blows me away. It blows me away that the people that are just angry and can't tell you why. Oh, I'm just, I'm just angry. Well, you got to understand something, folks. The outrage in America today is not Democrats and Republicans. The, the outrage today that's going on in your marriage is not your husband and not your wife. The, the outrage that is experienced in families with parents and children, it's not the parents and the children. The outrage and the anger and the bitterness that even exists in the church today, it's not this man or this woman. It's the devil, Satan, the father of lies. He who has come to steal, kill, and destroy. Every bit of it. He's behind it all. The devil was once an angel of heaven. Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. How have you fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn? You've been cut down to the earth. You've been weakened. You have weakened the nations, but you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Nevertheless, you'll be thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. You see, it was, it was pride, it was arrogance. We got the, the Satan and his cohorts thrown out of heaven, along with legions of fallen angels. They sought to overthrow God, and he sought to make himself God. And now he's been, he's been thrown down. And his demonic powers move to and fro across the earth, seeking to destroy everything that belongs to God, indeed everything that God has created. He desires to drag as many souls to hell with him as he can. And with every bit of fervency and strength and power he may have he seeks to destroy the church the church because we and we alone are the representatives of Christ on this earth today there is no other now he says stand firm against the schemes of the devil schemes wiles to be, to be crafty, full of tricks, lies, half-truths. That's, that's what it means when he, when he talks about schemes. And, and listen, let's, let's, talk about, now let's talk about some of these, some of these schemes. Well, first of all, he's going to tempt us. He's going to tempt us. I, I, love, I, I love young people, especially now that I ain't one. I love young people, children, youth, young adults. I love them. Because they're, they're, they're just full of life. Man, they're just, they're just full of energy, you know? 
they, they actually see hope where us old people sometimes just give up on it. And, and the devil comes against them and he attacks them with the, with the temptations, the temptations of the flesh. As, and he does older people too. But, but there's the temptations of drugs and, and alcohol and, and, and sex, homosexuality. Hey, let me ask you a question. Any of y'all watch SWAT on Thursday night? Uh, a few of us admit it. And so I record it, and I'll watch it, you know, I'll watch it later in the evening. And, and so I'm, I'm watching it last the other, the other night. And so, you know, it's bad enough. They're already teaching across the airwaves as much as they can to normalize homosexuality. Well, now in SWAT, they got a three-way going on. A man and his fiance, and then the lady that's on the SWAT team. Yeah, gross. Gross. And they just play it off as though it's something normal. It's just an alternate lifestyle. Are you kidding me? That's a lie straight out of hell. Just like homosexuality. You know, you can actually love the homosexual and not agree with homosexuality biblically. And, and, but, but, and then, you know, the, the, the devil, he'll tempt us with drugs and with alcohol, and he'll say, hey, try this. Try this. It's crack. Give it a try. It'll get you high. Give you energy. Make you feel good. But he doesn't tell you that one out of two people that use crack get addicted. He doesn't tell you that it'll destroy your life and restore your family. Hey, take this drink. Budweiser, King of Beers, and Miller Lite. Just relax it. Drink this. He doesn't, he doesn't tell you that you can become an alcoholic. He doesn't tell you that 175,000 people a year are killed on the roads of America because of alcohol. He doesn't tell you that 85% of all domestic violence has alcohol involved in it. He doesn't tell you that it'll destroy your life and destroy your family. Homosexuality is just an alternate lifestyle. Nothing wrong with it. God destroyed it. Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed that. And I really, I think E.V. Hill, the great E.V. Hill, uh, who's with the Lord now, the first person I ever heard, a big old black preacher. You'll look him up. Uh, e. V., Pastor E.V. Hill on YouTube. I love to hear that man preach. And he said, God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. That's the truth. And we can say, we can say, well, our God is a loving God. Our God is a gracious God. Our God is a kind God. He won't just send somebody to hell. God never sent anybody to hell. You'll go of your own free will and accord. God provided the way out of hell. And then Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And you don't do this. But, but, and then there's, there, there's that, there's that uh, 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 um, the sex of a man and woman, teenagers, outside of the bonds of marriage. I, listen, I'll say it. I don't mind it. Sex is a beautiful, wonderful, glorious thing inside the bonds of marriage between a man and woman. And that is the only way that God has ordained it. There is no other way. That's not to pass condemnation on anybody. Somebody say, well, you preachers, y'all just preach against everything. No, we don't. I don't preach against homosexuality. I don't preach against promiscuity. I don't preach against adultery. I don't preach against alcohol and drugs. No, I don't. I preach for Jesus. And I'll tell you what, I've walked the road. I've done the alcohol and the drugs and the promiscuity because of all the promises. It'll make you feel good. You'll be a big man. You'll have this and you'll have that. It's what, the, it's what all the crowd does. And I know what it's like to be almost a stripper. But I 
also know what it's like to live the Spirit-filled life in Christ and go from victory into victory into victory. Since the day I came to Jesus, listen to me, it's, I'm not bragging. You need to write it down because it's for you too. Since the day I came to Jesus, I have never been defeated. Yeah, I may have felt defeated. I may have felt defeated. I may have felt that things weren't working out like they should. I may have felt like lower than scum. I may have, but in Christ, in Christ, I have not and I am not and I will not ever be defeated. And if he can't get you with, 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 with the temptation of fleshly sin, then, then, then he's going to come against you with false religion. There are, there, are, there are billions of people around the world today that have bought into the devil's lie. Islam is not compatible with Christianity. Islam does not does not teach that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, died for your sins and rose from the grave, ascended into heaven, and seated at the right hand of God interceding for you. Islam teaches that, that Jesus Christ is a prophet of God. And that's all. And they also teach that you have to keep the five pillars, five laws. We'll, we'll, in fact, we'll talk about that on Sunday night in a few weeks. You have to keep the five pillars. And if you miss just keeping one of those pillars any day of your life, you can't go to heaven. That's a lie. Mormonism. There's a Mormon church right down the road. Mormonism. And believe it or not, there are a lot of Baptists today that don't see a lot of difference between Mormonism and Jehovah's Witness and Christianity. It's worldly different. Mormonism doesn't teach that Jesus Christ, it, they, it teaches that Jesus is one of the sons of God. In fact, Mormonism goes as far as to teach that, that if, you, if you live your life right here, if you do everything you're supposed to do here and, and you do it right, then when you do die, you're transformed and you and your wife and all of your kids Y'all get to go to a whole other planet where you get to be the God of that planet. They didn't put that in their book, did they? It's a lie straight out of hell. Jehovah's Witness doesn't believe in the Trinity. It's a works-based religion. Christianity. The devil, the devil is the father of false religion. And cults. Every one of them. Every one of them. And if he can't get you through temptation and he can't he can't get you through false religions, then he's gonna get you with your emotions. And we'll talk about it in that de in depth next week before we wrestle not against flesh and blood. See if he can't get you to give in to your temptations, the fleshly temptations and he can't get you to buy into the false religions and make them compatible with Christianity. Then he's going to find somebody he can use to make you angry. Get you mad. Because if he can make you angry and you can't let go of it, you're going to become bitter and unforgiving and resentful. And though you may belong to Christ, when it's all said and done, Christ can't use you. Jesus, Jesus said, forgive those. Forgive even as you have been forgiven. And he also tells us to love even as we have been loved. The devil is coming against us with all kinds of, of schemes, tricks, half-truths. That's what false religion and most cults are. They're half-truths. They've just got enough sprinkling of the truth in there 
to confound or confuse somebody. 1 Peter 5.8 again says, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary the devil prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He lurks about in the dark corners and recesses waiting to pounce and devour you. And I'm telling you folks, there is not a single one of us sitting here today that need to think we're above it. Because as soon as you think you're above that, you've committed the same pride that Satan did in the beginning. The same sin, pride and error. And it won't be long, you'll see your fault. The devil is lurking. He's scheming. He's crafty. He hates you. I wish you could understand this. There is a real devil out there in the heavenly places. We're going to talk about that next week. In the heavenly places that literally hate you. Loathe. Detest everything you stand for. Hates your God. And hates your Lord and your Savior. And he is going to come after you. Your marriage, your family, your church, and your community. You better know how. Goodbye. Why does the devil hate you? Why does he hate the human race? Why does he hate the church so very much? The devil was once the chief angel of all of heaven. He led the worship. Uh, Larry, the evangelist Larry Draper said one time when the devil fell out of heaven, he fell into the choir loft. Churches fight more over music than they do anything else. The devil was the chief angel that led worship in heaven. He was beautiful. He came to where he thought he was more than what he was. And so he was going to overthrow God and overthrow heaven. And he got, he got a, a third of the angels to come with him. God defeated him. There wasn't much of a battle, just a word. But God defeated him, cast him. And their eternal resting place will be in that eternal pit reserved for them. But in the meantime, they're in the heavenly places. And so in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he created the birds of the air and the beasts of the field, and the fish of the sea, and the grass and the trees. He created it all. He created it all for himself and all for his glory. And then God created man in his own image and breathed life into him. His life. In fact, the scripture says we were created in their image. We were created in our image. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And you are body, mind, and soul. You're one. But you're three. You were created in the image of God. And God created the human race to have that special relationship with that love relationship. God created a being that he could pour all of his love into and they pour their love into him. What Satan and the demonics were so mad about 
is that what they used to have, we have in Christ. And we can't lose out. The devil's coming at us. So we have to learn how to fight. But thanks be to God, we'll close. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're coming up on Thanksgiving. I saw something the other day that said uh, Thanksgiving is a forgotten holiday. No. Now if you know what I know and believe what I believe, every day is Thanksgiving. Every day. And God says to give thanks to him in all things. And so today, we can thank God for the victory. Even though we may not feel like it. Listen, your faith isn't based on how you feel. It's based on what God says. And so today, we can thank God for the victory that we have in Christ Jesus. We can thank God for Christ Jesus. Because our eternity is set in Him. We can thank God for the Holy Spirit that indwells us. And if we'll get the junk out of the way, we'll infill us every day. We can thank God that He has provided for us that we might battle with Satan and have victory over him. But it's in His power and His might, not ours. We, we can, I was thinking this morning, we can thank God. There are those spiritual giants in my past that stood beside me, that encouraged me, that built me up in my most holy faith, that, 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 that trained me to be the, the man of God and the Christian and the husband and the father. Thank God for those people. Thank God for the friends that he's put in my life, friends that literally stick closer than a brother. Thank God that I belong to a body of believers where we really want to love and encourage and build each other up. Thank God. You know what? Uh, when, when Randy, this morning, when Randy stood up here and he said all those were taken, we told him in the first meeting, 30 is all we could handle. That would be more than we've ever done. 30 kids. That, that was it. That was all we could do. But we had 45. Oh, ye of little faith. And then the pastor at the other church, he said, Ralph, don't worry about it. Whatever y'all have left, we'll take care of it. Praise God, he came over here Monday. He came over here Monday to get the, uh, to get the rest of them that we had left. And I said, I meant to text you earlier. There's not any left. There were four left on Monday morning. One precious saint came in here and got all four. Our church has taken care of all 45 of his children and his family, more important. I, listen, this morning, and you know, I, I know I, I go longer than most preachers, and so we don't always respond to an invitation. But I want to tell you guys, if you're here this morning, and you're living the victorious Christian life, you ought to hear, hit this altar and say thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. I don't deserve to be living and live the way I do. You may be sitting here this morning and you're struggling. You're a Christian. You're struggling. You're going through the valley. Just remember, when you get to the end of that valley, there will be a table set for you like you've never seen. Walk in his strength and his might. And if you're going to that valley, you still ought to come to the altar. And say, thank you, God. I don't feel like it. But I know the victory is mine. I don't know when and I don't know how. But I know the victory is mine, according to your word. You may be sitting here this morning, you're not a believer. My friend, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit is not yours. The promise of God's word is not yours. The armor of God to, that protects you is not yours. There is nothing in God that you can have if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior. And so if you're sitting here and you don't know Jesus, I ask you, I beg you, I beseech you, as soon as the invitation is issued, just walk up here and say, Pastor, I want Jesus. I want to walk in that strength and that might. 
and that power the rest of my life. I want to know Jesus as my Lord. So, Father, lead, guide, and direct this next invitation. Have your way in every heart and every life in Jesus' name. Will you stand?